What can we learn when we reflect on the teachings of St. Nicodemus the Hagiorite on the commandment warning us not to bear false witness against our neighbor and also not to slander our neighbor but to instead protect his good reputation? Why is it that slander is often a more dangerous sin than any other sin we commit against our neighbor? Can we commit the sin of slander when we are spreading the truth about our neighbor? Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Please feel free to follow along in the PowerPoint script we uploaded to SlideShare. St. Nicodemus was born to a wealthy family on a Greek island in the Aegean Sea in 1749. Although it was nominally under Ottoman rule, it was administered by the Venetians. From an early age, he studied the Eastern Orthodox Church Fathers, but he was also widely read in the Western classics, learning Latin and Italian and French. And he was a brilliant student. In the chapters we are currently studying in his book, Christian Morality, in addition to the Church Fathers, he also occasionally references Plutarch, Aristotle, and the Greek Cynic philosophers. So he must also be very familiar with the Greek and Roman Stoic philosophers. And his ascetic habits were a strong part of his faith. St. Nicodemus joined a monastic community on the Mount Athos Peninsula. This is a monastic province of many monasteries. You can practically enter only by sea, and women are not permitted to stay overnight. Over his lifetime, he resided at numerous monasteries, studying under various elders. These communities were granted relative autonomy by the Ottomans. And one reason why he is so strict in his teaching is he desires to show the Muslims that the Orthodox Christians are more devout. St. Nicodemus collaborated by St. Makarios on scholarly projects. They both edited the Greek version of the Philokalia, the collection of Orthodox classics published by St. Nicodemus and St. Makarios. He also edited the Catholic classics, Spiritual Combat and Treatise on Peace of the Soul, adding Orthodox practices. The resulting work, Unseen Warfare, was subsequently supplemented by St. Theophon the Recluse. Sometime in the future we will review this work. St. Nicodemus was not sympathetic to the Kalivadis movement, which was an effort in the late 1700s to totally reject the influence of the Western Enlightenment philosophy. But St. Nicodemus was also deeply traditional and deeply revered the teachings of the Eastern Church Fathers and was a leader of the Hesychist movement, which sought to preserve the prayer tradition of the Eastern Orthodox Church and is exemplified by the Jesus Prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. And this is often prayed contemplatively with a prayer rope, the prayer repeated for each knot. And he passed away at the age of 60 after a very productive scholarly life. And now we'll discuss the teachings of St. Nicodemus on the commandment, do not slander. What are we taught by our teachers? Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Except that this is not true. St. Nicodemus teaches us that King David in the Psalms feared slander more than sticks and stones, for good reason. For words harm our reputation, which sticks and stones can never touch. Wounds heal, but suspicions linger. St. Nicodemus quotes David from his longest psalm, Deliver me from the false accusation of men, and I will keep thy commandments. He repeats the words of St. Paul, I praise thy name, for thou hast preserved my body from destruction, and from the snare of the slanderous tongue. Our saint continues, The wise Solomon exhorts us to study the law of the Lord, so we can receive enlightenment, knowledge, and discretion in our souls, so we can guard against slanders, false testimonies, and betrayals of deceitful men. These are not exact synonyms, for many church fathers and preachers teach us that when we maliciously spread truths about our neighbor, intending to harm him and his reputation, we are committing slander. The exception is we can be more frank when discussing the affairs of a political or cultural leaders, as Luther discussed, and when providing testimony in a court of law. And those who slander do grievously hurt others, but their slanders hurt themselves. First, slanderers become sons of the devil, becoming disciples and imitators of the devil. And the devil is called a slanderer because he slandered and accused God to men, telling Adam and Eve that God, out of envy, had prevented them from eating of the tree of knowledge, lest they should become gods. Second, slanders turn slanderers into grotesque creatures. In the words of St. Nicodemus, the eyes of the slanderers resemble the eyes of a basilisk. That's the large ugly snake in Harry Potter. These eyes cannot see the glorious works of God, but rather see the flaws of others, while they seek to poison them with the venom of slander. The mouths of slanderers are like a deep pit, and he that is hated of the Lord shall fall into it. 
The tongues of slanderers are like a sharpened razor, but they're slanders and false witnesses that cut down and slay the guileless. The lips of slanderers resemble a snare. It was with slanderous lips that Judas betrayed Christ with a kiss. The hands of slanderers are defiled by the money they receive in payment for false witness. They have blood on their hands from the harm and death they have caused the innocent. Worst of all, this sin is easily passed on to your children. As St. Nicodemus teaches us, the children of slanderers and false witnesses do not walk the straight path of goodness, virtue, and truth, following God, but rather they walk on crooked paths, precipitous paths of wickedness and mendacity, always stumbling, always falling, always coming to grief. And third, slanderers ruin their own reputation, and they are often hated even by those evildoers who use their slanders to destroy those who have been slandered. Now, how do slanderers hurt those whom they slander? First, slanderers harm people's reputations. They are gaslighters. They paint the honorable as dishonorable, the chaste as unchaste, the pure as impure, the righteous as ruthless, the brave as rash, the thrifty as misers. They stir up scandals among friends, among acquaintances, among clergy and their flock, between employers and employees, between teachers and students. Envy also leads to slander, and we've already discussed the examples from Scripture that St. Nicodemus mentions. King Ahab was distraught because he envied the vineyard of Naboth. His loving evil wife, Queen Jezebel, promised him the vineyard, and she planted false witnesses at a banquet that falsely accused Naboth of blasphemy, and after his execution, King Ahab was granted his vineyard. And neither the prophet Elijah nor the Lord were happy about this turn of events. And we also learn that both King Ahab and Queen Jezebel were punished by God for their sin. And as Queen Jezebel died, the wild dogs of Africa tore her apart and ate her up, so that only her heels were left. St. Nicodemus retells the story of Susanna, where two peeping toms tried to coerce her into licentious behavior. When she refused their lecherous advances, these elders slandered and falsely testified that the chaste Susanna was a fornicator and adulteress, and that she who was honorable was dishonorable, that she who was pure was impure and defiled. And they caused much distress between that righteous woman and her husband and her relatives and the entire people of the Hebrews. With Daniel's assistance, Susanna's innocence was established and the two elders were put to death. And you see in the description for the painting, the focus on her body testifies to her innocence and virtue, as truth was often symbolized by a nude woman, but was also meant to appeal to male patrons, of course. Second, slanderers and in particular false witnesses can harm people's property. Bearing false witness can cause the innocent to lose a legal suit or suffer other financial loss. People can lose their businesses or their houses or more commonly their jobs. A friend of mine was forced to retire several years early because a female co-worker falsely accused him of abusive behavior. And not even legal action can erase the slight stain to his reputation. St. Nicodemus mentions the story in Maccabees about how a slanderer sought to seize the large fund that had been accumulated in the temple to care for a multitude of widows and orphans in the temple. The slanderer Simon told the king that this fund was far more immense than it was and that it could be easily seized. But when the king's official Heliodorus came to seize the treasure, heavenly beings, possibly angels, prevented him, frightening him and causing him to abandon this task. Now, in real life, this doesn't often happen. Similarly, the Jesuits became skilled fundraisers because they desired that the schools they ran in Europe should be tuition-free. And the story began to told that this religious order was fantastically wealthy. And this caused several kings in Europe to envy the fantastic Jesuit wealth. And the order was shut down so the Jesuit wealth could be seized by the kings, which meant that their schools and their ministries were also shut down. Third, slanderers, and in particular false witnesses, can harm people's lives. St. Nicodemus recounts that the Chaldeans went before King Nebuchadnezzar and slandered the three youths, saying they were not worshipping his image, so he threw them into the fiery furnace. As you can see in the icon in the stained glass window, an angel of the Lord came and protected the three young men from the flames. And St. Nicodemus recounts that the governors and satraps also slandered the prophet Daniel, so the king condemned him to the lion's den. But God closed the mouths of the lions, and he was unhurt. And St. Nicodemus also recounts the story of Esther, the Jewish queen in the harem of the king of Persia, who risked her own life to save the lives of her people. In the words of St. Nicodemus, Haman slandered and betrayed the entire Hebrew nation to the king, falsely testifying that they did not observe the royal laws, that they were an insubordinate race, that they were the enemies of the king, and that their laws were contrary to those of every nation. 
Haman was planning a pogrom to massacre the Jews in the Persian Empire. But after he was accused by Esther, the king was convinced of his ill intention, and Haman was hung on the gallows he had erected to hang prominent Jews. St. Nicodemus teaches us that the man who is a slanderer, a betrayer, or a false witness is another Judas Iscariot, who is mendacious, deceitful, unjust, and homicidal, a plague on the human race. He points out that Jesus does not merely call Judas a demon, a mere minion of Satan. He also calls them both devils. And St. Basil teaches us that whoever maligns another, and whoever puts up with hearing malicious talk, they both deserve to be excommunicated from the church. And the divine John Chrysostom teaches us that the devil is called by Holy Scripture a solitary wild boar because of his ferocity and uncleanness, such as the slanderer, who also betrays and bears false witness, since he runs back and forth like a wild boar, looking for slanders to concoct against his brother, and since he rolls around in the mud of impurities and then hastens to defile others who are pure, accusing them of impurity. And as St. Nicodemus teaches us, the slanderer breaks up friendships, sheds blood, denudes orphans, afflicts widows, destroys houses, wrecks villages, devastates cities, and annihilates entire races. The slanderer does not fear God, does not show compassion, does not listen to pleading or tears or groans. He has only one goal, to add slander to slander, betrayal to betrayal, deceit to deceit, falsehood to falsehood, thereby inflicting harm, dishonor, loss, and death. And you must also listen to the accusation of your enemies, and to understand this next teaching, we must keep in mind the saying by the Greek cynic philosopher Antisthenes, Pay attention to your enemies, for they are the first to notice your faults. And St. Isaac the Syrian teaches us that he who is truly humble is not perturbed when wronged, nor does he defend himself when he suffers injustice. Rather, he accepts criticisms as truth, and is not concerned about persuading men that he has been slandered, but asks for forgiveness. Here I've substituted criticism for slander, or calumny in the translation, so the passage makes sense. We must think the best of our neighbor. We must presume his criticisms are not slander, if we can, for how can we know if the criticism is valid? And this is true even when the criticism is meant as slander. And we must be especially forgiving towards our neighbor if we suspect that his motives are pure. And in our next video, we will reflect on St. Nicodemus' teachings of whether Christians can laugh and joke. As St. Nicodemus teaches us in his epilogue, to escape our torments, we must make haste to repent, to refrain our tongue from evil. We must keep the commandments of the Lord, not taking vengeance, but we must love our brother, covering his sins. Show your brotherly love by refusing to condemn him or betray him, so the Lord will see that you indeed possess brotherly love. And this concluding teaching of St. Nicodemus is clearly reflected in the classic Orthodox and Catholic prayer of St. Ephraim. Lord and Master of my life, take from me a spirit of despondency, sloth, love of money, and idle talk. But give to me, your servant, a spirit of sober-mindedness, humility, patience, and love. Yes, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own sins and not to judge my brother, since you are blessed to the ages. Amen. And now we'll discuss the sources we used for this video. Christian Morality was published in 1803 when St. Nicodemus was in his 50s, several decades after the publication of the Philokalia, and it references and repeats the many teachings of the Church Fathers in the Philokalia, which can be clearly traced in the footnotes. And my minor complaint is that the translators use several words that are not currently used in English. For example, calumnies, I rendered as deceit, usually. And also jape, which is an archaic word meaning jest. The translators defend St. Nicodemus, arguing that his teachings properly filtered should indeed influence our behaviors. And this is what they say. Because St. Nicodemus reflects the monastic propriety of his age, and the public behavior and ethical standards in the centuries in which he lived, he is often the subject of almost sophomoric contempt, if not open ridicule, by modern critics who harshly judge his advisement against secular music, secular singing and dancing, and frivolity as inappropriate to the Christian life. Not to mention his advocacy of virginity as a prerequisite for marriage, the avoidance of keeping pets, and under the influence of ruling Islamic customs, the veiling and virtual social isolation of women. And we need not view all of these restrictions as applicable to Christians today. But we must realize that St. Nicodemus was urging his fellow Christians to set a pristine example for the Muslims and Jews in the society around them. And this discussion reflects the classic debate between Stoicism and Epicureanism on the need to live an ascetic life, and the degree that you can permit entertainment and frivolity in your life, or whether you should always wear a dour Stoic expression, never showing emotions. 
What was true in the ancient world was that you needed to belong to the upper class to be able to afford to live an Epicurean lifestyle, but that is no longer true today. The middle class and upper lower classes can afford to go to the movies and go on vacation and enjoy themselves in ways the lower classes of antiquity could only dream of. Now, some of the later Epicurean philosophers were quite hedonistic, but in his writings, Epicurus promotes pleasures enjoyed in moderation. His is almost like a Stoic light type of philosophy. And what was the attitude of the Stoic philosophers to Epicurus? On one hand, the destitute Stoic Epictetus, the former slave of a former slave, detested Epicurus, often condemning his teachers. On the other hand, the fabulously wealthy Stoic Seneca admired Epicurus and quoted his works often. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.